This section is going to cover issues with memory. So problems that we have when we're trying to remember things, mostly forgetting. <clears throat> okay, so forgetting is the inability to recall something that you've previously encoded. Um, sometimes forgetting is due to poor initial encodings. We talked about how encoding can be pretty weak when you're not paying attention. Uh, sometimes it's due to the lack of cues that you need, so encoding specificity and transfer appropriate processing. You don't have the right environment to remember. And then sometimes forgetting is just because your brain isn't trying, isn't connecting the information. So some post encoding mechanisms. But forgetting is the inability to recall something. <clears throat> so to start, uh, it's actually good that we forget things. And most students always go, no, it's not when I tell them this. But think about if you could remember every uh, perceptual moment, you'd go crazy. Uh, so we forget so we can help remember where our, we parked our car today versus three days ago. Um, and then it's a, um, it's a good process for interpersonal relationships so you can forget those negative things that they said. So forgetting is actually a pretty good thing for you. <clears throat> Um, we talked a little bit about Ebbinghaus in the last section, <clears throat> but what he did was he um, examined how memory is encoded uh, for stimuli. And he was really the first person to do this, especially talking about retention intervals. So retention intervals are the time between encoding and retrieval. <clears throat> so looking at when you learned it and then when you're trying to retrieve it and what's the function of learning across, I'm sorry, remembering across time. And so the longer um, between encoding and retrieval, the, uh, the less you're going to remember. So it's this pretty picture. Uh, it's called the forgetting curve. And so what he did was he learned um, objects to 100%. So um, this is, we're doing really good and then measured himself in days. And so you could tell that the worst drop off is here right at the beginning. So you're gonna remember about 20% of this class, which is not very cool when you think about um, how much you're paying for it, one, and how I really want you to learn all this because it's so neat. But what the forgetting curve is, is, is that's the curve if you never were to study again. So here I learned all this information and then here's the decline if I weren't to study anymore. So he studied it enough to uh, remember all of the, the nonsense syllables he was trying to learn, like X, T, K, and then um, looked at the curve across time without any relearning. So some good news, you actually remember more of this when you uh, distribute your practice, so a little more plug for the uh, distributed practice rather than mass practice. <clears throat> But this was super important because no one had actually done this before. Um, and you do have to remember this is 1885 or something. So um, that seems kind of silly. Like, of course people have studied this. Well, they have now. They hadn't then. <clears throat> so what we're going to start with is sort of the old theories of learning. I'm sorry. Forgetting. Not learning. Forgot what section I was in. <clears throat> and these are the ways that we used to talk about forgetting. It's really cute. It spells dimmer because the memories are getting dimmer. I know it's two M's. Just roll with me here. So decay theory, interference theory, motivated forgetting, encoding failure, and retrieval failure. <clears throat> and then what we'll talk about next is the seven sins of memory, which is from Daniel Schachter's book of the same name. And those are the more recent names for uh, forgetting theories. Uh, and I really want you to focus on how these two tie together. So how the old theories and the new theories are, um, are linked to each other. <clears throat> so let's start with decay theory. Decay theory is exactly how it sounds. Um, your neurons do die, and we sort of have this use it or lose it principle in the brain. So if you are not using information, it is donezo. So memories are going to decay over time, <clears throat> was the idea. Okay, very much like Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve. Um, however, there's lots of research that shows that that's not the only reason. So if you ask people, if you're not 21 yet, go with 16th birthday, do you remember what happened on X day? Um, they can pull that from memory. And for some of us, that's been a while. Um, I can't remember what I did on my 21st birthday. <clears throat> and so it's not 
time because I haven't really thought about that once a year when I teach this class. Um, but, uh, you know, it is not only time that's the reason because people can remember events from the past. Um, <clears throat> so what else might be the reason other than just um, straight, I haven't thought about it in a while. <clears throat> And that's where interference theory comes in. And interference theory is um, one of the biggest theories in um, forgetting. And we've talked about interference before with the attention blink models. And this is the like fight models, this little hand motion. Okay. So the competition of information in your brain. I have one piece of information I'm trying to remember, but it's tied to five or six different things. And so I can't sort out which one's the one I want. And so having a bunch of information um, <clears throat> tied to something in the brain is actually good for you and bad for you. Duh. Okay, so it helps with elaboration and encoding, but when you go to hit retrieval, sometimes you, your brain is essentially confused. It doesn't know which pattern to activate. So retroactive interference, there's two types, um, is when you learn new information and that uh, inhibits your ability to recall old information. So the retro on the top uh, there means, at the beginning, means that is the piece that's going away. So the retro, the old stuff, is being lost because you've learned something new. <clears throat> and this happens um, like when you go home for Christmas break and you run into somebody you went to high school with and you're like, oh god, what is your name? So that old information <clears throat> has gone away because you've met all and learned all these new people's names. <clears throat> Uh, proactive interference is the reverse when um, <clears throat> informa old information inhibits learning new information. Okay, so the old information is so well learned it's hard to overwrite that with new stuff. Um, that's one reason why learning a second language can be hard later in life. It's also one reason why you might call your new boyfriend or girlfriend by the old boyfriend or girlfriend's name. Oh, ouch. If you do that, you can say it's just proactive interference. Let me know if that gets you out of trouble because I don't think it will, but that is why it happens. <clears throat> so I have a cute picture for this. Um, I don't know why the names of college students would interfere with the names of fish, um, but if you think names of college students versus your um, names of your old friends from high school and then your old significant other's name will overwrite the um, the new significant other's name. <clears throat> uh, the next theory is motivated forgetting. Uh, so this is your one moment of Freud in this class. Suppression is when you're actively weakening a memory um, because uh, retrieval is competitive, which is that interference theory, so it's a little bit of inference. So in order to um, remember something you need to know now, you have to suppress all of the uh, things that are related to it. So it's actually really tied to interference and the idea that you have this one piece you really want to remember. Where's my car today? You're going to suppress all the old car parkings so that you can remember where it is. Um, and then motivated forgetting is also really tied to um, memories you want to forget, like emotional memories. So you're trying to ignore them by focusing on something else. <clears throat> all right. The next theory is encoding failure. <clears throat> so encoding failure is this idea that information that we see even a hundred times doesn't necessarily get encoded correctly. So it doesn't go from short term to long term because your brain is essentially like, and eh, whatever, I won't need this. So if I ask you to vote for the right penny, this is a, um, a famous study, most people sort of waffle back and forth between I and A. It's A, I believe. Well, why don't you know that? You've seen plenty of pennies, right? So there's plenty of encoding opportunities. But since it's not important to you, um, you essentially just go, eh, whatever, and don't uh, get it into long-term memory. <clears throat> so that's this penny study here. So it's a short-term to long-term breakdown. The encoding didn't work. The opposite of that is retrieval failure, where the long-term memory is there, but you can't get it into short-term. So the tip of the tongue phenomenon is considered a retrieval failure, where you're like really close, and you oh, I've almost got it, it's like right there, can't think of what it is, 
um, that is a long-term, short-term breakdown. So encoding failure is it never gets to long-term memory. Retrieval failure is sort of the, the catch-all name for, um, I know it's in memory, but I, I, I can't get it. <clears throat> so one problem with studying um, all these different types of memory is, especially forgetting, is that um, it's a little circular as well. So if how do you know that there's a problem with memory? Well, they've forgotten it. Well, how do we know how they've forgotten it? I don't know. It's forgotten. So a lot of these, um, you sort of have to be tricky to study them <clears throat> because otherwise it's just, well, they forgot. Well, did they forget because it never got into memory or did they forget because it doesn't, it doesn't want to come out of memory? And so you have to do some sort of neat little tricks to be able to get at... Um, what types of uh, problems it really is having. <clears throat> okay, so those are the old theories, the dimmer theories. The newer theories are from Schachter on the seven sins of memory. <clears throat> His argument is that there are three sins related to uh, omission. Do you just, it's gone, forgotten, whatever. So transience, absent-mindedness, and blocking. Then there are three sins of memory related to distortions, which is not covered in that original um, that original memory set. That was more about just plain old forgetting. This is more about like what happens to memory. It's, so con it's a constructive process. So pulling a memory um, up in your brain actually changes it. So uh, inaccurate memories. And then one other sort of memory um, issue which is persistence, which is the opposite of motivated forgetting. You can't get rid of it. It's one at a time now. <clears throat> transience <clears throat> is the forgetting over time. So transience theory is decay theory. Let's be sure you got that. Transience theory is decay theory. It's the idea that I had it somewhere. I, I used to remember, oh man, what was it? <sighs> Right? So it's the loss of memory over time, <clears throat> and that retention curve, the ability to remember something, follows a power function. So that's Ebbinghaus's um, forgetting function. It's a power function. Um, I think it's 1 to the 1 over x, something like that. Um, so <clears throat> you get this, this decay of information over time. <clears throat> Absent-mindedness is my favorite one because I am super susceptible to absent-mindedness. <clears throat> and that's because I am usually thinking about 10 things at once. I have all these duties, all these jobs, these things I have to do. So I'm thinking, oh, i got to get this done, i got to get this done, i got to get this done. Student stops me in a hallway and says, blah, 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 chapter 9 homework. And I go, yeah, sure, cool. I'm totally not paying attention. Um, and so those attention lapses, I'm going to forget something. Um, and so I am usually either forgetting what the student has asked me to do, so if you ever have a question for me, definitely email me, or I'm forgetting the list of things I was trying to remember that I'm supposed to do. <clears throat> so a lapse in attention during encoding means that it doesn't get to long-term memory. So this is encoding failure as in, with a new name. So I don't get, it doesn't get in because of um, an attention lapse. That most commonly occurs when you're doing something automatic. Um, so if you have a routine that you use when you get up and uh, get ready for work, school in the morning, uh, that's an automatic process. So anything my husband asks me to do when I am between brushing my teeth and fixing my hair, it is not happening because I am going to just plug in through my routine. <clears throat> and this is also the idea behind highway hypnosis. Um, it's so automatic that your brain sort of tunes out because it's bored and so you'll miss something. <clears throat> blocking is one of my personal favorites <clears throat> so take a quick second write down all of the name or just name out loud all the animals you can think of that start with the letter E <clears throat> so what all did you write down elephant, eel um, ermines, one of my favorite um, there's elephant seals, there are, uh, eagles, so there are about 30-ish, um, and I'll provide that link online so you can look at it. It's basically a Wikipedia page of all the animals that start with E, uh, you could include equine for horse, um, but mostly what happens is people will only get a couple, 
You get like elephant, an eagle, an eel, elk. That's another one. Uh, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I'm stuck. That's blocking. So blocking um, is the new interference theory. So that there are uh, multiple associations uh, attached to a cue and uh, there's one association that's the strongest and so that just makes everything, it's the bully. None of the rest of that stuff is coming out. And so it's interference theory. I have one cue that's super strong and the rest of them are just kind of getting the shaft. I can't remember. <clears throat> so output interference, this is still blocking, um, is uh, when you remember something. So I get elephant. That, putting that out, like saying elephant, sort of even makes the other ones worse. So the initial remembering blocks the other ones. And then this really cool phenomenon called retrieval-induced forgetting. <clears throat> and so, um, uh, it's kind of the same side of the, uh, the opposite side of the coin for output interference. When I remember something, I'm having to suppress all these other things, and that will block those memories. So um, putting, saying something, output interference, like having, um, deciding on something blocks the other memories, but also just having to retrieve it blocks the other memories. <clears throat> so this is sort of what blocking and suppression are supposed to look like. So what's my email password? Come on now. <clears throat> and so I have to remember it. And then I have, oh no, two passwords or more nowadays, right? So I have my one for school. They require me to change it all the stupid time. It's got all these rules. And then I have my one for home, which is the simple one that, so I don't have to think that hard. If I am constantly retrieving the school one because I'm at work and I'm having to type on Blackboard or whatever, that will slowly block the personal one because I'm not using it as much. Okay, so you can have um, output interference and or retrieval-induced forgetting. Because I'm having to retrieve the school one so many times, that personal one is done. Which is why we have trouble remembering how to log in to pay my bills every month because those are separate passwords and I only do it once a month, whereas I use the school one 100 times a day. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> what you can do <clears throat> is um, study suppression with this. And so if I give you the Q, email password, the school one's going to come up because that's my school email. And so it's going to block out the personal password one. However, if I give you an alternative cue, um, oh, your personal password's based on a movie name. This is those uh, personal images that they use on websites for verification and the um, password reset questions. That cue can help me remember. So you can look at how much suppression is occurring by whether or not people will get this personal password if we give you a separate cue. If that is suppressed, I'm getting it either way. If not, um, that indicates that it's just blocking because of the stronger tie to school password. <clears throat> In the next section, we're going to keep going and talk about the sins of commission, um, the um, uh, distortions of memory, and then what that uh, implies about our memory systems.